right. Good morning, everyone. Um, can someone send me a chat message if you can't hear me? <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully the sound is good. It looks from my end that it is. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here uh, on our webinar today, which is about using EdMap's future range mapping tools uh, to learn something about what we might expect for invasive plants uh, in the coming decades. Uh, so this, this presentation actually, I gave a very abridged version of this during our Woody Invasive Summit, which was part of, uh, part of UMISC 2020. Uh, and I realized really quickly that the UMISC time slot, that 20 minutes just wasn't really enough to do this topic justice. So I made a mental note back then in November that I wanted to uh, do this again uh, with more time uh, and touching on more than just woody species. So here we are. Let's give a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. Uh, I'll be giving a very short introduction to MIPIN. I think uh, most of you are probably fairly familiar with us. We'll talk a little bit about what the constraints on plant distribution are, uh, a very quick crash course in climate modeling and what we know, uh, what the climate models tell us for the future of the Midwest. And then we'll take a deeper dive into the application of climate models to terrestrial invasive plants um, and look at Midwestern specific examples. Uh, I'll show you, I'll demonstrate a tool that will allow you to list out uh, species that are potentially of concern for your location. And then I will uh, present some examples I synthesized uh, using these tools. We'll look at new threats that aren't in the Midwest at all yet. Uh, then we'll look at some range expansion. So those will be species that are in the Midwest, uh, but are likely to expand their range in the region. And then uh, a little bit of a silver lining. We'll take a look at some possible range contractions as well, and some conclusions. So I think folks are probably mostly familiar with the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, but in case anyone isn't, uh, we are a regional organization. Uh, we work across an eight state and one province region shaded on the map. Our mission is uh, pretty simple to say, but a lot harder to do, but we, we want to reduce the impact of all invasive plants across the Midwestern region. The tags on the map uh, represent the location of MIPIN's board members. So we have pretty good uh, geographic representation. And then MIPIN staff is headquartered uh, just outside of the Chicago area, kind of in a centrally located place. If you'd like to learn more about us, I would encourage you to visit our primary website, that's uh, www.mipin.org. And then uh, we also run a newer website uh, specific to woody invasives, that's woodyinvasives.org. All right, and with that, <laughs> a little bit of a news flash. And I, I mean this tongue in cheek because I think uh, most folks are going to be aware of this, but not all plants can grow everywhere. Uh, there are many constraints uh, on where you might expect to see a plant. Uh, a primary one and the one we're really investigating today is climate, which includes both temperatures, both a, a lower temperature and an upper temperature range sometimes, and precipitation patterns, soil characteristics such as organic richness, uh, pH or acidity, which strongly influences how many minerals and nutrients the plant can, can get from the soil, uh, and then drainage patterns. Habitat type, especially with, with invasive plants, uh, we see certain invasive plants that are really require some level of disturbance to get a strong foothold, or they only occur in kind of early successional habitats, and then there are certainly others that are capable of um, entering into and succeeding in uh, much less disturbed and later successional habitats. Um, predation and disease, uh, sometimes invasive plants can be, and any plant can be kept in check by the uh, presence of uh, herbivores or disease. Um, sometimes we use this to our advantage, uh, 
with biological controls uh, on invasive species. And then of course, when you're looking at uh, non-natives and particularly invasives, there needs to be some sort of vector of introduction um, and, and then spread uh, for a plant to become invasive. So let's talk a little bit about climate and how it impacts plant distribution. So probably most of us are familiar with this concept of hardiness. And hardiness is described as, or defined as the temperature range under which a perennial plant can be expected to survive. Uh, now we are, obviously we're in the, in the northern part of the country. So I think we often use hardiness and cold hardiness as synonyms. Um, so cold hardiness, is the minimum survival or the yes the minimum survivable winter temperature for a plant, uh, whereas heat tolerance is kind of the other end of the scale. That's the maximum survivable summer temperature. I I think uh, that cold hardiness is more often a hard constraint. There are things that can mitigate summer heat, uh, for example, um, plenty of irrigation or or rainfall can uh, mitigate the, the heat of the summer a little bit. But if the, if the temperature, the soil temperature is simply, air and soil temperature is simply too low to support the root survival, the plant will not live. Um, a couple notes on hardiness. So hardiness from seed versus survival of a transplant is not always the same and it's not often well understood. Um, so just because a plant can be transplanted as an adult into an area and survive does not necessarily mean that it will be able to set seed or reproduce successfully from seed. However, plants are typically only labeled with, with one zone. So it's, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, this little image in the bottom right uh, shows an example of what you might expect to see on a plant tag at a nursery. Um, sometimes they only have the lower zone. So the, this plant is gonna be hardy to zone four, uh, which implies a uh, minimum winter temperature of negative 30 Fahrenheit. Um, then its upper tolerance is zone eight. Uh, and that's probably more of a heat tolerance issue than it is uh, the winter temperature of uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit there. Uh, just so you know, there are some good resources via USDA to uh, find out about plant hardiness. Um, so in the plants database, uh, which has recently gotten a facelift, uh, it looks quite different um, for many plants, but certainly not all. Uh, they have this tab called characteristics. Um, and if you scroll down into this uh, long list of, of characteristics for the plants, they usually have a maximum minimum temperature, uh, which you can transcribe into a USDA zone. And then you can also look up uh, the hard, your hardiness zone uh, at a pretty great degree of detail um, on USDA's zone map. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about climate modeling. Um, so this is important just to understand the basics as well um, for the rest of the talk. So what is a climate model? It's essentially a computer generated estimate of future climate conditions. And it's based on uh, our so equations and calculations that reflect our understanding of atmospheric processes, ocean circulation currents, and other natural phenomena. Uh, they usually use real climate data um, so what we, we know has occurred so far to predict the future. And then they also uh, require user-defined inputs. And uh, the most common user-defined parameter in these are emission scenarios, which uh, correspond pretty directly to expected atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, so you can run the same model using different emission scenarios and come out with different results. And then another important thing to understand is that there is no single true model 
um, for climate or climate change, uh, often what you see and what you will see uh, for these invasive, this invasive plant work is that experts use an, an ensemble approach where they run the same scenario in several different models and uh, try and find consensus between the models to figure out what the most likely uh, occurrence will be. Okay, so now, now let's talk a little bit about climate change and range shifts. Um, I want to uh, make sure we know what we're looking at here. So this image uh, is some projected climate change for the lower peninsula of Michigan is from a report uh, written by climate scientists for the Union of Concerned Scientists. And what they did, they modeled two different uh, emission scenarios. The first one is in the red color and it represents a, so a representative concentration pathway, and you'll see this again, RCP of 8.5. Um, and that corresponds directly to uh, one of the International Panel on Climate Change's emission scenarios, uh, scenario A1. And there's a little bit of controversy over this particular scenario. Uh, when I was in school, which was over 10 years ago at this point, and learning about climate change, this scenario was presented as business as usual. So it was kind of assumed to be what would happen if we didn't enact any policies to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, however, there are certain assumptions uh, in this scenario, particularly regarding fossil fuel development in the developing world, that a lot of climate scientists, not, not necessarily uh, climate deniers, but legitimate scientists find are overly aggressive. So it's possible this isn't exactly business as usual. It's more like a worst case scenario. Um, it does involve continual increase of CO2 emissions throughout the end of the, the 21st century. Um, for simplicity's sake, I'm not you know, gonna be able to resolve this issue. We're just gonna call it the high emissions scenario. And then this uh, map also takes a look at an intermediate uh, emission scenario, um, the, the climate or uh, the representative concentration pathway of those greenhouse gases is 4.5, so considerably lower than 8.5. And then it corresponds to the uh, IPCC scenario B1, which is intermediate emission reductions. And what you see if this is graphed CO2 emissions over time, uh, they start to level off around mid-century and towards the end of the century, they start declining below peak. Um, all right, and what does this mean for, for our mitten of Michigan? Well, they're saying that around mid-century under uh, an intermediate emission scenario, the lower peninsula of Michigan is gonna start feeling like Northern Kentucky and Southern and Central Indiana. And, under the high emissions scenario is going to start feeling like essentially mid uh, Missouri. And what's actually interesting is the, the climate zones between these two are not that much different. Uh, what we're really looking at, I'm just gonna peek over at my notes here. Uh, what we're really looking at under the low emission scenario mid-century is, um, A, so you're looking at a shift of one zone for the northern part of the lower peninsula, and then just half a zone for the southern part. Where you really start to see a diversion is towards the end of the century. Um, Michigan uh, down here, we're looking at uh, under an intermediate scenario, it's gonna mostly feel like Southern Missouri even into Arkansas. Um, and this is a change again of, of two zones in the north and one full zone in the south. Now, if we look over at this scenario, it, it's even more dramatic. Um, this is looking at a change of two and a half zones for the north and one and a half zone for the south of the lower peninsula. So 
could be some pretty dramatic changes. But of course, the states aren't actually moving. It's the climate that's changing and plant ranges might start to change as well. Or in fact, we expect that they will. Um, so a plant, in essence, what this is saying is that a plant that is currently pretty comfortable around here, around mid-century might start to feel equally comfortable around here and around the end of the century might start to be at home in Michigan. Uh, and the growing zones are essentially going to change. So USDA last year did its zone map in 2012. I know there was a lot of controversy over the degree to which the new zones would reflect climate change. Um, I don't remember what the outcome was, but probably this map is not going to be too useful for much longer. And there's a research paper where they reprojected the zones uh, for mid-century. They did use this high emission scenario. Um, and this, this is helpful. So it lets us see what's going on in the rest of the Midwest, not just in Michigan. Um, so right here in Chicago, we're currently in rain uh, in zone 5B. We might expect by mid-century it's going to feel a lot like zone six, possibly even zone 7A is right here. Um, zone five, where Chicago is right now, is all the way up here in northern Michigan. Um, and then the coldest part of the region is, continues to be northern Minnesota, but it's zone 5A. Uh, zone B, or sorry, zone four and zone three are completely gone, more or less. I think there might be little fragments up here in the very far north. They're all up in Canada now. Um, so these are pretty dramatic changes again. Um, and so just a little uh, levity here. Um, the author of this paper is an agronomist and they were looking at it uh, for what this means for crops. Um, so we can potentially make almond butter throughout most of the Midwest <laughs> if, you know, this uh, under this uh, high emissions climate model. Um, but, you know, it, it it's pretty serious uh, for what it means for our native plants and for invasive plants as well. Uh, this is another view of anticipated temperature changes over time. Um, this is from the uh, National Climate Assessment. It's from the 2014 one, not the most recent one, which was 2018. Uh, the reason I didn't use the more recent one is they simply didn't include, for whatever reason, um, these maps, which I found very helpful to, to understand. Um, so under a high emission scenario again, uh, oh, and I should point out, this is, this is annual average temperature. This is not the same as the zone maps because the zone maps are based on expected winter minimums. Um, but we, we see a, a similar pattern of warming, certainly, with the most dramatic potential changes for the northernmost part um, of the region, particularly the upper peninsula of Michigan and, and the, um, upper, uh, the upper LP. Uh, you remember uh, when we had that Michigan moving map, um, the northern zone shifts were, were more than the southern zone shifts. And this bears out here as well. But we are expecting to see increased uh, temperatures certainly across the entire region. Um, there's this other band here of, of moderate to high shifts and then maybe a little bit less um, for the southern part of the region, but still significant, um, you know, under this scenario up to 3.5 degrees of warming. Uh, the temperatures aren't the only thing that change. Uh, climate or uh, precipitation patterns may also change uh, as a result of shifts in climate. Um, so this Graphic on the left, this is from the same source that uh, 2014 uh, National Climate Assessment. Uh, on the left, uh, this is showing what we might expect for precipitation changes. And essentially, there's this band across the central Midwest where uh, they're anticipating somewhat more dramatic increases in precipitation uh, than with kind of stability to more moderate increases in the south and also in the north. 
Um, and what's important for plants um, about precipitation is not just that it happens, but when it happens. Um, for the most part, speaking in, in generalities, we're expecting a lot of this increase in precipitation to happen in the winter and the spring with fairly small changes in what, in what we'd expect to see from, from normal in the fall and um, in the summer and fall. That is different a little bit though, uh, if you're looking at Missouri here. So what this uh, graphic is showing is consecutive dry days or essentially drought conditions. And what we see is that there's greater risk of long stretches of dry time or drought uh, happening in the south of our region. So that is also going to influence uh, where plants can be happy. So now we're going to get into the real meat of this presentation, which is how this information about expected climate change has been applied to invasive plant ranges. I want to be very, very clear that this work uh, was not done by Mithen. Um, this citation here is, uh, is for specifically the uh, EdMabs tool work. Uh, it was led by Jenica Allen at Mount Holyoke College and uh, with other colleagues in the Northeast who were part of this Northeastern risk uh, management project. Uh, and then the translation in the EdMaps was facilitated by the EdMaps team, uh, Chuck Bergeron and uh, Joe LaForest at the University of Georgia. It's merely my task to try and understand this work and synthesize it into ways that can be useful uh, in the Midwest. So I want to talk a little bit about the methodology for the actual modeling that they did. Uh, they started out by listing out all terrestrial plants, um, terrestrial invasive plants, and they got these uh, from all the regulatory lists from both the, the federal um, APHIS list and all lower 48 state lists. And then they supplemented it with plants that are included in University of Georgia Bugwoods Invasive Plant Atlas that maybe aren't regulated. And they came up with 1,089 plant species. And then they started whittling down. Um, so they removed any species on that original list that had fewer than 10 georeferenced occurrence points when they were doing the work, which was in 2004. Uh, and they weren't just looking at EdMaps for this presence data. They actually used 33 different sources, including multiple databases and herbaria, or, or herbarium records, um, which are usually geotagged um, with plant collection locations. Uh, they also kicked out all species that are native to some part of the lower 48 states. Um, so a few Midwestern examples, we consider these plants invasive in the Midwest, but they are actually native to part of the, of the lower 48. So black locust, palmer amaranth, the ragweed species, those are just some examples, there are more. Um, so they, after they made these reductions, they were able to conduct modeling for 896 species. What they did is uh, they used MaxEnt habitat suitability modeling software. And what this uh, model does is essentially uses existing distribution data to project where else a plant may potentially occur, where it might find suitable habitat, plant or animal, um, either, either in, under current conditions or in the future. And they actually did both. Um, so the first thing they did, they, they did some bias adjustment uh, to the distribution data. Um, you know, when there are a ton of records for in, in EdMaps or anywhere else for a certain plant in a certain place, it's hard to know if it's really because it's more ubiquitous there or if uh, there was simply a project where people were going out and looking and reporting it. Um, so they did some adjustments to try and to eliminate that kind of a bias in the distribution data. Then they did the modeling under current climate conditions. Uh, and the, the parameters in the model they were adjusting for climate were the minimum average 
uh, January temperature, which they used as a proxy for cold hardiness, the maximum average July temperature, which they used as a proxy for heat tolerance, and the average annual precipitation. Okay, so then they did, they modeled future climate conditions expected in the years 2040 to 2060 using 13 different global climate models. Uh, so remember earlier I said there's no one true model and a lot of, uh, a lot of modelers use an ensemble approach. That's what they did, an ensemble of 13 different models for 896 species meant 11,648 model runs. Um, I am glad I am not that computer that had to do that task because it would have taken a while. Um, another important piece of it, uh, information is, is the climate scenario that they use. They use the same one for all the models and they use that intermediate one. Uh, so that's the um, representative concentration pathway or the greenhouse gas concentration 4.5 AKA IPCC scenario B1 or intermediate emissions is not the most extreme thing that, that could potentially happen as a result of climate change. If you have questions or would like to know more about the methodology, um, I point you to this citation, uh, which was the publication of the work that underpins the AdMaps tools. So for any unit of space, <laughs> uh, there are four potential outcomes. And I've color coded them here using the same color code you're gonna see on, on the map tools later. Uh, the first outcome is that the species is not currently reported in the particular place, but future suitability is predicted. And that uh, they use their orange color to represent range, ex uh, range expansion there. A second scenario is that the species is currently reported in the place and future suitability is predicted as well. That's a stable situation. They used a light kind of lavender color for that. A third is that the species is currently reported in a place, but future suitability is not predicted. Uh, they use dark purple to represent a range contraction. And then the fourth potential thing that can happen is the species is not currently reported and future suitability is not predicted. That's kind of the null situation and that they just left white. So just to mention some limitations uh, with these tools and with the work, uh, they don't automatically update with new distribution data added to AdMaps or anywhere else. Uh, if we wanted to update it for new distribution data, those uh, 11 something thousand model runs would have to be done again. That's something I could see happening in the future, but probably not right now because they just published uh, about five years ago. Um, there's going to be much, much better estimates uh, for species with more distribution data. You remember I mentioned their, their floor for the minimum number of points was 10. That's a really low floor. Um, other folks that use maxent modeling usually look for uh, more like 100 to 200 points, especially when you're looking um, over a national scale, you see some really funky results uh, for species that have very few uh, distribution points. So I, uh, in the examples I'm going to show, I did not use any species that have very few distribution points because they're kind of really funky. Um, I mentioned earlier, it can be a little difficult to interpret these for species that have more than one growth strategy. Uh, so for example, plants that can be an annual and, and self-seed um, if, if it's too cold for them to uh, have perennial growth over the winter, or they might be perennial. Uh, and then the other change you might see is that um, something might be able to seed in certain zones, uh, but otherwise can still persist and uh, reproduce vegetatively. Um, it's not always obvious what's going on there. And then finally, uh, results don't necessarily, re necessarily reflect non-climate related constraints on distribution, for example, acidity, soil type, salinity. Um, again, you're gonna see a much better job uh, of, of the, or a much better reflection of other constraints for species where there was uh, sufficient uh, distribution data used in the modeling. Okay. 
So we're gonna start on our first tool demo now. Um, I'm gonna show you how you can uh, make a list of potential range expanding species uh, for wherever you are. Um, the idea here is that it can, potentially these lists can inform early detection and rapid response efforts in the coming decades um, and allow us to stay better at the left of the invasion curve i.e. finding uh, invasive species populations when they're still relatively small uh, and eradication spread prevention is still feasible rather than up here when uh, they're already everywhere. All right, so I'm gonna minimize out of this and pop on over. So um, this tool is located at edmaps.org forward slash range shift listing. And it allows you to essentially create a map of species um, or a list of species for the place you're interested in with the amount of certainty you're comfortable with. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna demonstrate where I am. So you can do it at the entire state level. Uh, Illinois, of course, is a long, narrow state with uh, pretty big differences in um, Hard, plant hardiness zones between the north and the south. So I'm gonna choose a northern county. And for my, uh, so essentially you need to choose the number of models or the amount of uncertainty you're comfortable with. If you want the most species uh, listed that you could possibly have, you're just gonna choose, you're gonna choose one. Um, and this will give you, so it, it kind of live updates we see we've got 259 uh, species showing up that um, at least one model says they could potentially establish in Illinois uh, mid-century. And then 13 is obviously the most conservative. Let's go down here. We're down to 183 uh, species. And of course you can choose in the middle. The other thing it'll let you do is refine the list um, so the default setting is it, it's showing me species that are present in the US anywhere in the country that modeling uh, says could potentially come to DuPage County, Illinois. Um, I can, this will probably be the most restrictive. So it has to be actually in my state somewhere um, and potentially coming to DuPage County. Oops. I don't know if that updated or not. It doesn't look like it did. Um, or you can set it to a fixed radius. Uh, species only in the same ecoregion that I'm in, which I think is Eastern forest. Or um, species from an adjacent state. So this would be only, only nearby species. Uh, and then you can download your list. Uh, this will download a uh, CSV form. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's, um, I've played around with it a lot. And so for the examples I'm gonna show uh, in the next few minutes, these are species that, um, so I looked at all the state lists for the Midwestern states, and these were species that showed up a, a lot on the list. Um, go back to my PowerPoint here. We're gonna start with a few species that are uh, not really well established in the Midwest, or if they are, it's really isolated occurrences. Um, we'll look at these and then go on to, to species that are in the Midwest, but are gonna be expanding range. Um, and because folks might not be super familiar with uh, these six species, I did uh, do a little slide for each one. So uh, you're gonna have to bear with me while, cause I will be flipping back and forth a lot from uh, between the slides and the web browser. Hopefully uh, folks won't get too dizzy. Uh, so the first one we're gonna look at is, is giant reed or Arundo donax. This is uh, a, a very large ornamental grass that is hardy to zone six. Uh, however, it's going to be dying back seasonally um, in, in zone six. Um, I think it can be kind of evergreen uh, in subtropical areas. 
It was introduced as an ornamental, as so many of our invasive plants are. Uh, in the early 1800s, it forms these bamboo-like groves. Uh, it's been used for erosion control. And it has a very long history, as in like biblical times history, as a material for basket making. Um, and actually, the introduction history of this species to Europe is fascinating. It might be the earliest recorded example of uh, um, a species invasion. Uh, it was brought to Europe from Iran, um, traded by very, very early traders, uh, again, um, thousands of years BC. Um, and it is actually recorded on um, tablets, <laughs> the Babylonian tablets of trading these reeds. We don't know for sure that it was this species, but it very well could have been. Um, but unfortunately, it can become invasive in riparian zones and wetlands, uh, and it's very easily spread. The, the spread mechanism is, to me, kind of similar to Japanese knotweed because it spreads mostly by rhizomes locally and then by root or even uh, stem fragments um, across greater distances. So now I'm going to pop back into, here we go. Um, so how you got to um, the, the climate modeling information, you want to just look up whatever species you're interested in, uh, in EdMaps, and then you need to go to the county view. So folks are probably familiar with this. This is uh, going to show us the counties uh, where this species has been reported uh, in green and then white just uh, means that it hasn't ever been reported there. You can see it's this species really doesn't have a presence in the Midwest. And for the 896 species for which the work was done, you will see up here future range and future certainty to the far right. And we are going to look at future range here. I already have it open. So with the default setting when you open future range is that it's only got one model selected. Um, and on, uh, on this default view, what you see is that the, the orange cells mean that there are no current records for that county and at least one model of the 13 predicts suitable future climate, uh, climate compatibility. So that's a range expansion. Uh, what you see on the light purple is that there is a current record and at least one model predicts suitable future uh, suitability and that is kind of range stability. With the dark purple and one model selected, what this means is that um, there is a record there, but no models predict future compatibility, so there's likely to be a range retraction. Well, there's either going to be a range retraction or there was a mistake with, with the distribution record. Uh, that happens as well. And the last uh, potential scenario is white. That simply means there's no current records and no models predict future suitability. Um, the other uh, numbers of models I like to look at are six and seven, because these are kind of tipping point situations. So let's go to six. At six models, if you've got dark purple and six models, that means the majority of models are predicting a retraction. And if you've got white with six models, that means the majority of models are predicting unsuitability. Versus seven, now with seven, if you've got orange, that means the majority of models are predicting range expansion. And if you have light purple, that means the majority of models are predicting suitability. And then if, if you uh, want to be very, very certain, you're going to want to look at 12 or 13 models. Um, and if we do that, what we're seeing is that it's almost a certainty that this species will find suitable habitat in southern Missouri, uh, southern Illinois, and southern Indiana uh, in, by mid-century. And if we're going moderate, it might come up to the central areas of, of these states uh, into central Ohio, possibly a little bit uh, on the thumb of Michigan, 
Uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, probably safe. All right. So I'm essentially just going to go through um, all those species I had listed on my slide uh, in order. So this one is Dallas grass. Oops. Uh, Paspalum dilatatum. This is a warm season grass that's hardy to zone six. It was introduced as a forage crop in the late 1800s. It forms these coarse clumps um, and it is a sod forming grass. Um, it has kind of short rhizomes and then very fibrous roots. Uh, it can be invasive in disturbed areas like uh, wetlands and riparian zones. And it's also of concern as an agriculture and turf weed uh, because it forms these coarse clumps. It's essentially a, like a very warm season crabgrass looking thing. Um, and it spreads, of course, as many grasses do by seeds over distance. And let's go back here. So again, um, <laughs> I, I will note that I'm I'm fairly sure these um, these is showing that there has been a report at some point uh, in Minnesota and northern Wisconsin of this species. These are not in AdMaps distribution. Um, this is one thing that's kind of annoying about about this is um, you can flip over to AdMaps distribution. It's gonna take a second to load, apparently. We see the, these records are not in, in there. So these probably came from somewhere outside of maps and you'd have to go back into the original data set to figure out what they were. Um, I'm not 100% sure they existed just based on, again, the hardiness of this plant. Anyway, um, so with low certainty, uh, we are seeing a pretty big expansion of the potential expansion of this species through most of Michigan, um, certainly uh, the Great Lakes coastal area of Wisconsin, uh, much of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. If we want uh, to have a little bit more certainty, um, well, it possibly won't be able to reach those uh, colder central areas of the Upper Peninsula, but still making significant potential inroads. Um, and then with higher certainty, well, maybe only through kind of north central Illinois, but still Indiana, Ohio, uh, and into the LP again, Missouri for sure. All right. Um, I meant to show this with Arundo Donax, but um, the other view of this is, is pretty nice to use, uh, or it can be nice to use as well. The only issue is that you lose the distribution component. So if you flip over into future certainty, it essentially gives you a heat map of how many models um, are showing potential range compatibility. Um, so you, know, you also lose the state outlines, but Indiana, Ohio, for sure, uh, compatibility, most of Illinois, um, but less certain, you know, less certain for, for Wisconsin and for the UP, and certainly for this uh, central region of the upper LP. All right. Next species, uh, Lespedeza bicolor. Um, of the Lespedeza species, this is one is maybe lesser known in the Midwest. Um, the hardiness information about this one is confusing. Um, some sources say it's hardy to zone four, and what they likely mean is the root system will re-sprout um, at zone four, um, but it's essentially acting like a like an annual. Like the, it doesn't produce any woodiness um, or, or yeah, stems that maintain over winter in zone four. Um, its seed hardiness is probably more likely around zone six, but again, we don't fully know. Um, another complication, so this was introduced in the mid 1800s as an ornamental, but it's also been used for many other purposes, including erosion control and mine reclamation and widely as wildlife and game bird forage. And uh, it was introduced multiple, multiple times from many different places across its native range. So that's again, why, why the hardiness is a little um, difficult to determine because there are multiple varieties of it. Some are likely more hardy than others. Uh, this picture was taken by uh, Chris Evans, who's on the MIPPIN board. This is Southern Illinois. 
uh, you can see this is looking kind of like what Barberry often looks like on a forest edge, um, really overtaking the understory there. Uh, whereas happiness, uh, happiest right now in the southeast, uh, it can form both open and, uh, or it can form this kind of single species growth, both in open and semi-closed habitats. Um, and it spreads primarily by seeds. Uh, these pea-like flowers give way to um, kind of dry seed capsules that are readily spread. Let's look at our map. What is this one? All right. So um, with not so much certainty, um, it's looking like certainly all of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and, and Missouri are vulnerable uh, into Wisconsin and again, coast. Uh, coastal Wisconsin and most of the LP. If we want to increase the certainty to moderate, um, we see a little bit of contraction, maybe not so much in Michigan or Northern Illinois. And then a high degree of certainty. Um, the most vulnerable places are gonna be all of Missouri, Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, potentially this coastal area uh, and much of Ohio as well. Okay, just a few more. Um, so a secret bamboo, Nandina domestica. This one is hardy to zone six um, and it can also be kind of evergreen uh, to zone eight, maybe kind of similar to winter creeper. Uh, it was introduced again, early 1800s as an ornamental shrub. It is not a bamboo, which is a grass, but it got its name because it has these very upright, very close together uh, stems that look kind of like a bamboo grove. Um, where it uh, has been planted, it's used for this four season interest. Even if the, it's not evergreen in a particular zone, it has these red berries that persist on the plant very brightly through winter. However, it's a forest understory invader of the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic. Uh, birds spread the seed, um, and actually overconsumption of the fruit has been linked to cyanide poisoning and cedar wax wings. These fruits are pretty high in cyanide compared to native plant fruits that they would otherwise eat. All right, next map. Um, so again, this is the low degree of certainty, moderate. Again, uh, the most vulnerable areas are the south of the Midwestern region. Um, and with high certainty, we're going to potentially see this in southern Missouri, Illinois, Indiana. All right. Let's get into some, uh, oh, this, this one is fun. Uh, trifoliate orange. Uh, this is a large shrub or small tree. Um, it's hardy to zone five, maybe six. Uh, certainly six, but maybe five. It's one of those ones, again, where the roots may be um, hardy, where the rest of the plant is going to die back seasonally. Um, this was introduced as an ornamental barrier hedge or a novelty. It, it's got an interesting look to it. It's sometimes used as a rootstock for citrus, probably not in the Midwest. Um, and the fruits can be eaten. They are related to oranges. Um, but they are very, very seedy uh, and very, very sour. So they're mostly used with a ton of sugar and marmalade or like a candy peel type situation. Uh, it's invasive in both open and semi-closed habitats in the South and Southeast. Might be kind of similar to Osage Orange uh, in our region or maybe white mulberry, you know, kind of these edge habitats. It spreads by the seeds, but not really eaten by birds. The, the fruits are just too, gross for them. Uh, it tends to be more small mammals eat the rotten fruits after they fall from the tree. Uh, oh, the funniest part about this, it was used extensively on the University of Oklahoma campus uh, as a deterrent to students uh, kind of marching across the quad and ruining the grass, apparently. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, the map here, this one shows a really extensive potential range. Again, I think because it has that zone five hardiness. Um, 
with, with moderate certainty, it's looking like most of the Midwest is potentially vulnerable to this. Um, and then with a higher degree of certainty, maybe not the northern zone, but certainly the southern part of our region. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's not a done deal that this will move north, but uh, if there's a vector, it certainly can. And last one that we're really going to profile um, is this parasol tree. Um, this one is less hardy than the others I've looked at. It's, it's really only hardy to zone seven. It was introduced a long time ago. Um, it has been used as a shade tree. The, the picture doesn't really do it justice, but the leaves can be up to a foot across. So it casts some really deep shade. Um, and it has interesting bark and stems. Um, again, they kind of look like bamboo, honestly, especially when the trees are young. They're very straight, they're kind of green. Um, however, it can be invasive uh, in disturbed habitats in the south and southeast. It spreads by seed. This is actually a picture of the seed. It looks like a little shriveled raisin. Um, these are mostly sp uh, spread by gravity, uh, but wind and water can play a role. Um, and what it tends to do uh, is form single species stands uh, where the seeds just scatter beneath the parent and they all germinate. It's very, very shade tolerant and it grows very, very fast. Um, Polonia, which hopefully I'll get to in just a couple minutes, is a little bit similar. Um, so let's look at the map for this one. I mean, re recall this is a zone seven plant. So with lower, with the low degree of certainty, it's probably only going to potentially make it to about the midpoint of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. If you want to increase this, uh, the southern parts of those states through mid uh, Missouri, then high degree of certainty, it maybe only might make inroads to the very most southern part of our region. All right. So then the other thing I wanted to show. I probably won't get through all these just looking at time. I've only got a few minutes left. Uh, but there are potential Midwestern range expansions uh, among a number uh, of plants. And uh, so calorie pear is one we'll look at, winter creeper. Then I want to do aim or honeysuckle for sure. And I might have to skip the rest of these, but I would encourage you to look at them yourself. All right. So let's see where we are. Calorie pear, we start to see a lot more distribution data in here. It's already spread through most of Illinois, most of Indiana, a lot of Ohio, um, and it's made inroads to Wisconsin. Um, so what, one thing that's super interesting to me and suggests that this modeling is certainly not perfect is it's showing that this plant should not be able to persist in Dane County, uh, Wisconsin. There are over a hundred records of it in Dane County, Wisconsin. That's, that's where University of Wisconsin-Madison is and they've been recording it left, right and center. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. Maybe it's a precipitation thing, but it certainly shouldn't be cold, cold driven. If we increase certainty, it is showing Again, like retractions in Northern Illinois as well. Not too sure about that. <laughs> and then I, th I wonder if this one even got done backwards somehow. So yeah, this is, this is a little baffling, uh, but it, you know, there's potential some range contraction for calorie pair. Winter creeper is another story though. Um, Low degree of certainty, uh, we might start to see winter creeper becoming viable in uh, southeastern Wisconsin. Of course, this is a plant that is absolutely in trade all over the place. Um, all of Michigan, including the UP, potentially most of Wisconsin. Uh, with moderate certainty, Minnesota is probably safe. Southern Wisconsin, however, is still in there um, and uh, much of the LP and all of Illinois. Hi, if we're looking for high certainty, still looking at so entry into southern Wisconsin uh, through all of Illinois um, as a potential invader.
The other one I wanted to look at was Amor Honeysuckle, um, because this is one we're super familiar with in the Chicago region. I mean, it's just ubiquitous, uh, but it seems to have a fairly solid kind of ceiling of, of, of where it's been able to establish, probably around the zone line between zones five and four. Um, but of course, like we talked about, those zone lines are shifting. Uh, so with a moderate degree of certainty, we can expect Amor Honeysuckle to potentially make inroads to southeastern Wisconsin or Minnesota and pretty much all of Wisconsin um, and higher certainty, uh, pretty much the same thing, maybe northern Wisconsin might be spared. So we've got these, these new incomers, these range expanders. Um, a few of you might be sitting there thinking, oh my God, we are in such trouble. Isn't there any good news? Well, I did look and I was able to find some range contractors. Um, again, I don't think I'll have time to show you all of these, but let's look at certainly at Canada Thistle and maybe Common Buckthorn um, and see what's going on with them. And unfortunately, it's not good news for everyone. Um, but at least at the southern part of the range, you start to see some erosion. Um, so zero models are saying that uh, the Canada thistle is gonna find a hospitable home through most of Missouri and the southern half of Illinois and Indiana. So that can only be good news. Um, and if we flip to the certainty uh, around moderate, no more Canada thistle potentially in Missouri and most of Indiana, most of Illinois. High certainty, pretty much all of Illinois, most uh, the lower half of um, Michigan and Ohio, sorry, Minnesota and Wisconsin, you are still going to be dealing with Canada thistle. Um, and then common buckthorn. Um, again, really demonstrates uh, it, like a, a lower limit. It can't seem to really get a good foothold below maybe five, or sorry, rain zone 6A, it starts to have trouble. Um, so Detroit area, uh, probably not gonna be dealing with buckthorn uh, in another 40 years. Um, flipping this again. Is, yeah, the lower peninsula and parts of Ohio seeing the most contraction. Um, this, this is less likely, but uh, potentially all of the eastern portion of the Midwest will see much less buckthorn. Uh, but again, I'm sorry, Minnesota and Wisconsin, you're still going to be dealing with buckthorn. All right. So just in conclusion, these tools are freely available for you to explore in the maps. Um, species that are invasive south of us may become increasingly prevalent in the Midwest. Um, they do still need a vector though. So we need to be extra vigilant for species in trade and species with readily portable seeds or root generating parts that get spread by accident. Uh, species that are currently at the southern extent of their tolerance may become less dominant and eventually absent, particularly in the southern part of our region. So that's the silver lining on what is otherwise kind of a dark cloud. Um, but in general, uh, highly adaptable invaders, especially ones with a broad tolerance, are going to become more prevalent overall as ecosystems destabilize. Because remember, climate change doesn't just infect and impact invasives, it's also impacting all the native plants uh, in, these ecos in our ecosystems as well. So this is certainly, um, the future is gonna be interesting. <laughs> Maybe it's job security for all of us. I know I used all of my time talking. Um, I am happy to stay around though and answer any questions folks might have um, if you are also able to. And I'm gonna look at the chat.
when I select a one specific county in the list tool, I get a much larger list of species than when I select all counties. Why is that? I am not 100% sure. I think probably it has to do with what has already been reported in your state versus what has been reported in your county. Um, so if you are in a county that has uh, does not have a lot of EDMAPS reports, you get more species on your list, and a lot of them are probably already there. Um, they just have never been reported. So that is one issue with the tool uh, in general, is that it's only as good as the distribution data you have um, for, your, uh, for your location. Um, would you please show the potential contraction slide again? Yes. I think you mean this slide. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you, the ones I didn't get to, to take a look at them uh, yourself. Glossy buckthorn is pretty similar to what I showed for, for common. Um, Japanese knotweed, I'm gonna show that one. Um, I think this one might be precipitation driven because it's kind of the western part of the range you start to see and strange little pockets like here in, in southern and central Illinois and again in the Detroit area. This, this area is, is going to be heating up quite a lot. Um, but yeah, western Wisconsin maybe we'll get a break from uh, or is likely to get a break from Japanese knotweed and other potential zones right here and here. Go back to that slide. Just a couple of thank yous. Um, so thank you very much for sticking in with me. Um, if you want to email me any questions, sorry again, I didn't get to them. Uh, there's my email address. And um, I'll probably send a follow-up survey uh, just for feedback about um, what you got out of this. But also, um, I'm interested in what other webinar topics folks are interested in. So I will ask a question about that too. All right, thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.